the Good Chemistry Podcast. I'm your host, Nick Jacomis, and today I'm speaking with Dr. Yasmin Hurd. Yasmin is the director of the Addiction Institute, chair of translational neuroscience, and professor of psychiatry and neuroscience at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York City. Her research explores the neurobiology of drug use, including the impact of cannabis, cannabinoids, and opioids on the brain and behavior. Dr. Hurd conducts both basic research into the mechanisms of drug action using animal models, as well as clinical work in humans. Dr. Hurd and I discussed a variety of topics related to cannabinoids, opioids, and the neurobiology of addiction. Much of our talk focused on the research her lab has done on CBD, or cannabidiol, including its effects on anxiety and its potential use in the treatment of opioid addiction. As always, if you enjoy the content of this podcast, please like, share, or subscribe. I'm also experimenting with a new tool called Locals. Locals is an app that allows podcast hosts and other creators to interact and build a community directly with their fans. If you go to goodchemistry.locals.com, you can sign up to become a Good Chemistry community member. This allows you to do a variety of things, including communicate with me and with other community members. You can make posts, you can ask questions that will be answered either by me or by other community members. You can make suggestions to the show. You can actually ask questions of me directly in a live chat tool. And I'll be posting uh, content here, including episode updates and upcoming guest lists. And so if you want to try it out for free, use the promo code GREATCHEM, G-R-E-A-T-C-H-E-M, and you can become a part of the community through the end of May 2021. Today's show is brought to you in part by Dosist, an all-natural cannabis company specializing in dose-controlled cannabis products made with plant-based ingredients. To learn more about Dosist, their products, and where they are available, please visit their website through the link in the episode description. And with that, here's my conversation with Dr. Yasmin Hurd. Dr. Yasmin Hurd, thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me. Can you tell everyone where you're at, where you work, and just a little bit on your background as a scientist? Yes. Um, I am the director of the Addiction Institute at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York. And my, I'm a neuroscientist. I study the neurobiology of addiction and the, with the goal of trying to develop medications based on what we learn about, uh, as I said, the neurobiology of addiction. So you do a lot of research on CBD that ties into your work as an addiction scientist. And CBD is very popular right now in general. You can find it at the corner store. It's sort of this big health and wellness craze. Can we start out by just having you explain what is CBD and what do we know about its basic biology? Yeah, it's been a, a real roller coaster for me in context that, like you said, CBD is now everywhere in the water, even literally in the water. <laughs> uh, and um, so CBD is cannabidiol. And cannabidiol is a cannabinoid in the cannabis plant, or many people now, I think, even know hemp plant. But um, it's one of about 140 cannabinoids. The cannabinoid that most people on the street know about, or before CBD became so popular, was THC, or is THC. And THC is the cannabinoid that leads to the high, you know, the rewarding effects. And CBD, though, does not produce intoxication like THC. So CBD cannabinoid definitely impacts the brain. So it does have um, biological, psychological effects, but those effects are not. Um, linked to the intoxication aspects of cannabis. And a lot of the research now, um, my group and others is looking at it in regard to you know, aspects of anxiety, craving, et cetera. And so CBD is a plant cannabinoid like THC, as you mentioned. We have an endogenous cannabinoid system and endogenous cannabinoids. Can you speak a little bit about how CBD influences the endocannabinoid system in our bodies? So our natural cannabinoid system, as you said, the endo, the endogenous endocannabinoids, um, we have their lipid um, chemicals, 
and they bind to cannabinoid receptors. And there are two main cannabinoid receptors in the body, the CB1 and CB2. The exogenous, the plant-derived cannabinoids like CBD and THC, they interact with our natural endocannabinoid system and primarily at these receptors, but mainly for THC. So THC is an agonist that binds to our cannabinoid receptor. CBD actually does the opposite in part. It's an inverse agonist, meaning it has even antagonistic effects um, at the cannabinoid receptor. However, it modulates our natural lipid or natural endogenous endocannabinoid ligands that binds to these receptors by enhancing the levels of these, these ligands through is thought inhibiting these transporters that take up the, these natural cannabinoids. So perhaps I should step back and say, you know, what are uh, coming back into the biology of endocannabinoid system? So these endocannabinoids are made when your body needs them. So that we call them made on demand. And many transmitters in the in the brain, especially since I'm a neuroscientist, I'll focus most on that. Um, they're synthesized and stored. And when they're needed, they're released. And but the endocannabinoids, they're actually synthesized on demand, and then they transport back across the, 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 the space between cells, the synapse, and are taken up by transporters, these chemicals that take up the endocannabinoids. And it's believed that CBD inhibits these transporters. And so therefore the natural endocannabinoid levels then um, are elevated but they're not elevated dramatically, but they're elevated. So that's one of the mechanisms, um, a few of the mechanisms by which CBD um, directly and indirectly modulates the endocannabinoid system. Interesting. So when you ingest CBD, potentially, at least to some extent, you may actually change the levels of your own endogenous cannabinoids. Correct. But um, again, there are, there, there's, let's just put it this way. There's a lot of research that's needed. Um, so in terms of finding out um, the true mechanism um, by which CBD works, because in addition to the endogenous cannabinoid system, CBD actually interacts with multiple transmitter systems. So for example, it will modulate um, our opioid system in part even, it will modulate serotonin, a transmitter that's really important for regulating mood. Um, it's, it will modulate, you know, so a number of transmitter systems. And that broad pharmacological effect of that CBD has is interesting because it's actually not potent, really, really potent at any one of them, hmm. um, except a new, um, an orphan receptor that it now appears to work as an antagonist for this receptor that we're still trying to figure out the actions of this um, transmitter system. But being able to tweak, it, it, you know, small amounts, different um, transmitter systems actually is not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. In pharmacology, we used to call these quote unquote dirty drugs. But I've started to look at it very differently after studying CBD now, because a lot of times when we try to develop these, these medications that are very powerful at one receptor system, it normally leads to side effects because you're mm -hmm. either really hammering um, as an agonist, really turning on one receptor or really potently blocking another. And CBD tweaks, it turns up the knobs to up and down for a number of transmitter systems, but not in a powerful manner, but in a way that modulates that really is more in a way homeostatic, I think. Hmm. So it's it's tweaking many different receptors or, or systems in the brain. It's not really potently affecting any one of them. Can you speak a little bit more about what we know about CBD's drug properties? So you mentioned, and people have mentioned previously on the show that it's not a particularly potent drug, but you just mentioned that that could be a benefit. What else do we know about drug-like properties? So toxicity and bioavailability. I mean, every, every drug, every medicine has positive and negatives. And every 
Um, it comes back to dose. Dose is everything. And so, yes, CBD at especially the doses that are people are taking in their water or their coffee and so on, and you know, um, is not at a high dose that was normally going to be toxic. There's been a lot of studies on CBD at doses. Um, so when people buy them normally in, you know, the, the, um, on this, the boutiques and so on, for example, 10 and 20 milligrams, 25 milligrams of CBD is what's um, normally sold. On a clinical level, most of the studies are studying 100 to like 600 milligrams of CBD. And those studies do not find any adverse effects really in terms of, um, you know, toxicity at a level that you would say, this is not a medic, this is not going to be used as a medication. And what I mean in terms of liver toxicity or other things, there's definitely um, studies that have even gone up to 6,000 6, milligram CBD and, and not found, hmm. you know, really bad side effects. The side effects that people have mainly seen are more gastrointestinal, so GI tract, diarrhea kind of thing, even sleepiness. But now CBD is being that part of its negative, quote unquote negative, could be used for people, you know, for sleep, inducing sleep. Mm. Um, for the negative side effects in terms of liver enzymes, and so of course, toxicity in terms of your liver damage is always an issue with every medication. And for kids that were treated with CBD for epilepsy, um, the interaction with some of their anti-epileptic um, drugs could lead to changes in, in elevating the liver enzymes, and that's not, not good. But in other um, clinical studies that have gone on so far, and yes, many of them are small, they've not seen um, you know, this type of toxicity. So interaction is really important for the negative things that one are, you know, that many of the studies are showing, and like I said, you know, anti-epileptic um, medications, it interacts with, um, you know, say antidepressant medication, um, benzodiazepine, anticoagulants. So many of most drugs obviously are metabolized or broken down in by our liver and the liver enzymes CBD could also um, work at the, the, those enzymes can also um, be um, targets for um, modulating CBD's metabolism. So that's the thing we try to make sure that, you know, um, it, it's important that when you're taking other medications, like I said, an anticoagulant or antidepressant, um, it's really critical that you let your doctor know that you're taking CBD because CBD could in fact influence how that drug is metabolized. And that drug could also metabol um, influence how CBD is metabolized. And that's how you could increase say toxicity. Interesting. So CBD is fairly benign on its own, but because it can impact metabolism of drugs in the liver, there can be these drug drug interactions that we pr presumably just don't know a lot about yet. Correct. And we're going to know more since now there are a lot more studies being done um, with CBD. I mean, a lot of animal studies have been done and shown um, obviously a good um, profile or else it would never have gotten past the FDA to even go into clinical trials. So most of the animal studies had shown that it did not have these, you know, terrible or, you know, adverse events that we would not want to develop it for a medication. Mm -hmm. And because this is such a big component of the health and wellness industry at this point, you see, you know, you see claims for just about anything you can think of. CBD is claimed to help with sleep, pain and inflammation, mood, almost anything you can think of. We know that, you know, you've got an FDA approved medication, Epidiolex for epilepsy. What are the other areas where there's at least some clear evidence that CBD has a positive impact beyond epilepsy? You know, this is the challenge where you have, you have a drug that's actually going before as I said, the, the cart before the horse. Mm -hmm. So the research is not there to substantiate all of the claims that's being made about CBD um, for its clinical properties. So as you said, other than epilepsy, um, there have been some small studies done 
in relation to, for example, schizophrenia in terms of psychosis, showing that it has potential for having antipsychotic properties. Similarly, for anxiety, that it has an anti-anxiety properties, anxiolytic um, properties. In our research, we showed also, in again, small studies, that it decreased craving and anxiety in people who had a heroin use disorder. Um, there are studies going on for Crohn's disease. Um, there are studies going on um, with for pain, but most of those studies are inconclusive. So there, there's still a lot that we don't know, even though it's being touted as basically like a miracle drug for all of these um, indications. And I never believe in miracle drugs. Um, I believe in miracles once in a while, but I don't believe in miracle drugs. But I do think that a, a drug can have benefits in different indications because the common went back again to dose and the mm -hmm. dosing regimen. So perhaps for certain symptoms, you will need a high dose, you know, how many, two times a day, while for another indication, you could only need a small dose once a week or something. But these are the things that we need to find out about CBD and the data is not there to really give conclusive, um, you know, insights to the public that's now buying up CBD, uh, you know, in a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So you've done some work that I want to get to eventually related to CBD's effect on as a treatment for addiction. But before we get there, I thought it would be good to have you talk about opioids and the treatment of pain. So how do we, how do we normally treat pain today? And how do opioid drugs work on a basic level? Um, so, you know, Pain is one of the symptoms that most Americans or, you know, um, can relate to. And that's why you have over 10 million people being um, medicated with opioid analgesics. And the opioid analgesics, if you have acute pain, trust me, give me an opioid. If I have a nail that just went through my hand, I want, you know, that pain to stop. Um, and they have been quite effective clinically. And so opioids, um, they modulate our natural opioid system. All of these drugs, they're, they, are, they impact on something in our, system, in our bodies, obviously. And the endogenous opioid system is really key to um, regulating or translating a lot of, like you could say, the, you know, um, signals from the, your sensory. So like I said, you know, I got a nail in my hand, the signals that go through to my spinal cord to then register that, that, um, th that injury, the, the signal in the spinal cord are mediated by the opioid um, peptides, our natural opioid peptides, our natural um opioids are, and they bind to opioid receptors there. And they also um, then the signal then goes up into our brain where opioid system, again, modulates the perception. So it's the brain that perceives the pain. So that's the nociception of it. But that whole signal from your hand to your spinal cord up to your brain, the opioid or endogenous opioid system is part of that process. So Opioid analgesics, they will inhibit, um, they will activate, sorry, those, um, those opioid receptors. And those opioid receptors will then inhibit the natural other transmitter systems that mediate these pain signals. And so, for example, a transmitter even called glutamate, where it will, you know, trigger um, the re release of glutamate and substance P and other peptide that really um, mediates these pain and opioids will then reduce them. So it's an interaction. The opioid system sits at the spinal cord and um, brain circuits that are important for sensing and the nociception or um, the signal of pain and the perception of pain. Mm 
that's a long way to say it's complicated <laughs> in part. Yeah, yeah. So we have an endogenous opioid system and an endogenous cannabinoid system. The endogenous opioids are peptides, so they're almost like little proteins as opposed to the endogenous cannabinoids, which are small lipids or fatty yes. molecules. Exactly, exactly. And so are the opioids, are they used on demand like the endocannabinoids or are they more like other transmitters that are stored and released? So the opioids are exactly like other transmitters that are stored and released. And so um, uh, the cell activity will trigger the release of these opioids. And that's the thing. So our, our again, our natural endogenous, whether it's opioids or endogenous cannabinoid system, they are at physiological very low levels. And now you take a very potent opioid and you will overwhelm that system. For pain, that's good because now you're blocking much, much more strongly the, the, the pain signals. And that's what um, these opioid analgesics do. The problem is that they not only at those, um, they not only stimulate opioid receptors in the pain pathways, they can also stimulate opioid receptors in reward pathways that, and that's why with repeated use long-term, you then get activation of these, um, the quote unquote addiction related, um, neural circuits. Mm -hmm. So opioids are not merely blocking pain or altering pain perception. If you take an opioid, even in, even when you're not in pain, it feels good. So they have these perceptual uh, emotional effects in the absence of what they're doing to block any pain signal. Exactly. Exactly. And, and is that why they are particularly addictive as a class of drugs? Yes. And they're addictive as a class of drugs because those mu opiate receptor, the opiate receptors where um, these um, um, morphine and oxycodone and so on, where they bind. Um, and so I just said a particular receptor like this, this is called the mu opiate receptor. And this receptor sits in, like I said, neural circuits that are immediate reward. And these rewarding um, circuits in the brain and when stimulation, very profound stimulation of these opiate receptors, it leads to this rapid um, um, euphorogenic, hedonic, nice feeling state. And certain opioids do that much better than others because it's very rapid into the brain and out. And so, for example, fentanyl, it's bang, it hits these receptors very hard. And so the brain is like, wow, I just like got this incredible, you know, rush, This, and then it's gone. So this very fast um, pounding off our natural rewarding um, pathways, that's one of the things. Also, they elevate, they, they, they indirectly elevate the transmitter dopamine. And many people know, you know, even on the street, if you're, even if you're not a neuroscientist, what dopamine is. And dopamine is a transmitter that's very much um, um, a critical part of addiction neurobiology. So dopamine goes up, you feel good. And these opioids increase dopamine very much. Interesting. So how do you how do you actually define addiction as a neuroscientist? And in particular, I often hear people talk about substances that are psychologically versus physically addicting. And typically, as far as I can tell, what they mean by that is if something is psychologically addicting, it's basically less addicting than something that's considered a hard drug that's very physically addicting. Is that a valid distinction? And how do you think about the spectrum of habit forming potential of drugs as a neuroscientist? So for me, um, when people think that psychological addiction, it means that it's not as addictive. That's actually false. Um, as a neuroscientist in the addiction field, you know, I go by what the clinical diagnosis relates to addiction. So it's a, a disorder, a chronic disorder that um, is related strongly to compulsive types of behavior, craving, um, you will give up so many other things in search of this drug, in, in the need for this drug, um, despite all the negative effects that this drug may induce, you're still taking and using and seeking, as I said, this drug. Many people, like you said, put that as a psychological. However, um, there is significant, I mean, the you don't need physical addiction 
in order to have a, a substance use disorder, a strong addiction. And it's this chronic and relapsing disorder. And for me, you know, the controversy is it a is it a brain disorder? It's a brain disorder. It it, you know, are the neurons, the circuits that mediate the reward, the circuits that mediate the changes in cognition, that the decision-making processes, the craving, the emo- the negative emotional state that drives even the drug-seeking behavior, that's all in the brain. And it's a whole brain disorder as well. We may know specific circuits that might mediate the reward that might mediate the cognitive that might med- mediate the anxiety might mediate the depression but there are many circuits that all go together to you know undermine the homeostatic state of the normal quote unquote brain that's not um, seeking and needing and um, dealing with all the negative aspects of addiction. Many people think about addiction that people are just trying to get high. That's not addiction. You know, um, the initial stage, of course, when someone takes a drug and they feel really great and they want to do that again, perhaps the next time, maybe even a few years later, and they do it and again and again, that's not addiction. Addiction really is about, as I said, you know, the negative aspects. People are in and you use the word psychological, you know, the psycho- the psychological pain that drives a lot of the 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 um, you know George Coop, who now heads the National Institute of um, the NIAAA of Alcohol um, Disorders, this dark side of addiction he used to call it, and you know this dark side drives a lot of the behaviors to seek the drug and so on. So for me, addiction is a complex disorder. It's not as easy as people think to just, you know, stop or that it's just driven by reward. It's uh, it's a very complex disorder. Hmm. So you know, drugs of abuse often feel good. And so they have these, these positive effects that people like initially, but with escalating usage, as your body adapts to that drug and gets used to it more or less, the absence of the drug in your system can actually cause negative issues. And you're saying that relapses often, in part at least, due to people trying to avoid those negative feelings that come with the absence of the drug that they've been, they've been accommodated to. Absolutely. And, you know, but also, you know, stress is a huge aspect of drug seeking. And just most of the things that people, why people search the um, relapse comes back to these negative things that happens in their lives, the stresses that happen, the, you know, the depression that happens. And so it's not that people are really going to try to get that reward again. Yes, definitely. It's not a, um, there are people obviously who seek drug to feel good. And the question is, you know, at different stages of the addiction cycle, that's another thing. It's a cycle. You're not in the same place the whole entire time. Mm -hmm. And that's why it also makes it complex because in early stages of the addiction, even when you know that you're, it's driven a lot by this more positive reinforcing effects and you know, definitely that it might lead to some negative, you're still, wow, this feels good. And then the slippery slope. And then before you, you, you start losing that control. And then when you lose it, that control, you're already lost that control to then go back. So you, the stage of addiction also obviously is mediated by um, different neural circuits and that's why treating addiction can also be challenging because where someone is an addiction, you can't treat everybody the same. Mm-hmm. And often a lot of the treatments are the same. Hmm. What are some of the typical treatments for severe drug addiction that would be used in the clinic today? Um, that again is one of the problems with substance use disorders is that we don't have as many tools in the clinic as we should. So for opiate addiction, at least, um, for opiate use disorders, we have um, opioid replacement therapies, such as methadone, buprenorphine. For other substances of abuse, for example, the psychostimulants like cocaine and so on, you mainly treat the symptoms. So, you know, you will treat the depression, the anxiety. And so those often are the medications that are, are, are given. 
So it's not that there are so such specific, except for, like I said, for, especially for opioids as, as a part of our discussion today, but there are not that many specific medications. You're, you're, you're treating, as I said, the symptoms that that person may be showing at that time. And there's a, there are a lot of behavioral interventions to try to help people manage their, their disorder. How is addiction to become addicted to a drug? Does it require repeated use of that drug? Yes. So, you know, um, and, and I think that this is one of the things that get a lot of people who feel that individuals who have a substance use disorder, that they kind of brought it on themselves and they're weak and all of that. But it really, you know, isn't there are a lot of things that we know that increase the risk of someone developing a substance use disorder, even genetics, you know, early hmm. life trauma is a huge issue as well. But even with every every factor that could contribute to addiction vulnerability, if you never take the drug, you will, of course, not develop a substance use disorder. Mm -hmm. If you take the drug once, you need to take it again and again to change the neural circuits in a way, as I mentioned, in terms of changing, you know, cognition, changing your anxiety, you know, all of these circuits. However, for some people, because of their vulnerability, just that exposure to that to that drug once, they 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 quickly can transcend into addiction versus others, and it depends also on the on the drugs. So, for example, opiates are very addictive, while cannabis is not. So, you know, you can if you're you can give you know ten people or hundred people or how many people you want in your 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 study an opioid and, um, and, and cannabis, and you're not, and obviously a larger percentage of people are going to become addicted to opioids than well to cannabis. A few people will also become uh, addicted um, to cannabis, but it's going to be much fewer. Mm -hmm. So the type of drug also matters in terms of coming back to our earlier discussion of hitting, you know, hitting um, those reward circuits um, the, and the endogenous um, uh, transmitter systems like dopamine, you know, so those transmit, those drugs that have a big impact on dopamine, they're going to be much more addictive than those that have a much smaller effect on the dopaminergic system, for example. Mm -hmm. So it sounds to me like there's at least three sort of uh, sets of factors that affect the addictive potential of something. One is the drug itself and its level of potency and how rewarding it is. Two is just intrinsic features of that person. There's just genetic and developmental differences between people in terms of how sensitive they are to any given drug. And then three, we've sort of touched on this indirectly, that would be the context or the environment in which the person is taking the drug. So there's the, the famous experiments in rodents that have been described by others where you, know, you give a rat access to a drug of abuse in a cage where it has nothing else. There's pretty much just the drug and maybe some water. And then you give another rat or even the same rat access to the same drug, but it's got access to toys and mates and friends yeah. to play with. And the second rat is much less likely to become addicted than the first one. And the same thing happens in humans. So yes, rats in our, in our studies, they're bored. If you're you know, brought to a cage where you can like hit a drug, and you and you put back in a cage where you're by yourself and you have nothing else. To, yeah, even if your mother said don't do it, you know what? When you go into that cage, most likely um, nine out of ten people would push that lever. Um, and so that's the whole thing. Environment matters. Another factor, actually. So you you you're great at translating every single thing I've said in a much very I love it clear manner and development. So. The developing brain is also critical. So the earlier exposure to a drug, we know that it, it increases vulnerability to addiction. While if someone starts when they're you know, an adult much later, we don't see the same addiction vulnerability. Does it mean that an adult can develop an addiction? No, they can still develop it, but they're not going to be as sensitive. So all of the, there's so many factors that go into why 
an individual, what, why this one person develops an addiction and another doesn't. And I call it like the Russian roulette. You know, each person is given a gun with a certain number of bullets. And this person has many more bullets because they have their, you know, had some genetic risk. They're in a much tougher environment. They got started earlier. They had a huge trauma. So practically, if it's a six gun, if six, you know, six bullet gauge, they have like five of those are filled with a bullet. Well, this person perhaps have one. So that's why when people think, oh, that person is just weak or they are just this, they have no clue until you walk in their shoe and knows exactly what has happened to them and the lives and all and the and their forefathers' lives. You know, it's really challenging to say everybody should be the same in terms of addiction vulnerability. Mm, that's a great. That's a great metaphor. I've never heard it put put quite that way. So, in terms of treating addiction, um, we talked about some of the standard treatments. It sounds like there's basically two kinds of options for addiction treatment. One is to give people drugs that are more or less weaker versions of the drug that's causing the problem, and the other is simply to give them other drugs that treat the symptoms of withdrawal, like anxiety, say. So, and the third, behavioral. I mean, so I, I, you know, if we're talking about um, treatment, I do think that behavioral interventions are really important, even though I am a, a neurobiologist trying to develop a pharmacological treatment, I, I, I do think that uh, behavioral interventions are important um, adjuncts for everything that we, we, we think about for treating substance use disorders. And so do you think that, you know, in the current situation over the last year, people are, my understanding is that drug abuse has probably gone up considerably since COVID started. And do you think it's essentially for the same reason that the rats in the boring cage are more likely to get addicted? Yeah. And it's been stressful with COVID, you know? Um, and so people are isolated and they don't know what's ha going to happen. And it was just a stressful time. And it's interesting, you know, um, the alcohol stores were considered essential business during COVID. And in one part, I understood it. But of course, it's you're giving people, you're, you're giving them a, a product that will increase their addiction vulnerability or not addiction, but increase their risk of, you know, getting into alcoholism. And some people have, and definitely a lot of the research has shown that there's been an increase in um, all substances. Um, and last year, I mean, the overdose increase, over 82,000 people, I think, died of overdoses last year, the highest uh, for a very long time, even though like the opioid um, epidemic, you know, we had so many people dying and it bumped up again last year. So we forget that there is an epidemic that is still going on, even though we have this pandemic of COVID and that epidemic of, you know, drug overdose and opioid overdoses is still real. And it's, it's extremely sad. It's extremely sad because it kind of gets, um, you know, lost in all of the stress of COVID and all of obviously the horrific numbers of people who have died from COVID. Mm -hmm. Can you start to describe for people some of the work that your lab has done in terms of CBD as a potential treatment for addiction? And I want us to be careful. One of the things that's very interesting about your lab is you do both animal research and you do hum human research. Usually those- I'm masochistic. You know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a good sign. I'm masochistic. Let's just put it that way. I'm just like, okay, why, why? <laughs> so can you describe some of that research and we'll just be careful to distinguish between the animal work and, and the human work and where each one is at? Yeah. Um, so my research program for many years um, actually had two lines and they converged. The two lines was looking at the neurobiology of, of, of opioid addiction. And I studied on a molecular level people, for example, who have died from opioid um, overdose and animal models where they self-administer heroin. 
and trying to see if we if we can figure out what is really changed in the brains of humans who have an opiate use disorder and we can replicate that in an animal model we can actually start now coming up with treatments and that was the strategy for that line and then the other line of research was that we knew that many of the adults who, um, who had an opiate use disorder started out with you know other drugs like cannabis and so we started to look at the neurobiological effects and also even genetics. We looked at different factors of what really, you know, could contribute neurobiologically to some of the things that we saw in heroin users. And when we looked at cannabis, we started looking at our animal models and we studied like the prenatal effects of, of THC and the adolescent effect of THC when they became adults and we looked mm. at did they self-administer heroin and and so on and we could see for both prenatal and adolescent thc exposure that when they were adults they actually self-administered more heroin especially under stressful conditions not every rat just like humans there's behavioral traits to certain things you can talk about another time um, that we're delving into in terms of trying to understand your biology of that but when we were doing our animal work and we always inferred it to cannabis, but we were actually studying THC. And as I mentioned in the beginning of the discussion that there are over 140 cannabinoids in the, in the cannabis plant. And so I said to my team, let's at least study one other cannabinoid. So we're not just saying that this is cannabis when it's really THC. And so we decided to look at CBD. And I wanted to look at CBD because at that time, I mean, it still is technically, it's the second most uh, enriched cannabinoid in, in the cannabis plant. Over the years, CBD has gone down dramatically in the recreational plants on the street, while THC concentrations have gone up really into my too much. So when we gave CBD to our animal model, we were actually surprised. We, I thought actually, if anything, would make an increase too, as we saw with THC. And we saw that there was a reduction in their heroin seeking behavior. And what I mean by that is um, just like humans, when, when animals take a drug, the context, the environment with which they take the drug starts to have meaning. So when the animals self-administer a drug, a light goes on in their environment. And so we can show them the light later after they've developed, um, you know, this chronic drug taking behavior, we can show them the light and they're not getting the heroin, and, but they're still pressing the lever to try to get the heroin. So that light is enough to be that environmental cue. And so that's when we gave them CBD it actually decreased their heroin seeking behavior. So that lever pressing when they're not getting a drug, but their environmental context or a stress, um, we call it drug seeking um, as an analogy to the human. And so for me, it was fascinating. And it was fascinating because in the animals, even like a few weeks after their last CBD administration, it still was having an effect on decreasing their drug seeking behavior. So, because like I said, I'm masochistic, I wanted to see whether or not it would work in humans because there are a lot of studies that are done in animal models. We publish, and it drives me crazy, practically every week we've cured a disease in a mouse or a rat, but it doesn't get translated to a human. And so before I went down the journey of trying to see whether or not CBD was worth that investment to figure out how it worked, I said, let's at least look in the human. So yes, it's unusual to jump that quickly. So we then carried out um, pilot studies, which are a little challenging, we can talk about another time, but um, we saw that, and it was placebo, double-blinded. So neither the, the, the study participants or the investigators knew what they were getting or giving. And we, we showed them videos just like the, the animals in terms of having a cue in their environment. Mm -hmm. And we showed them like a heroin cues versus a placebo cues like trees or something, you know, water, uh, water. And those individuals who had been given placebo and shown the heroin cue, they craved and CBD reduced that craving. So it replicated our animal studies and what we had studied in the rats at that time in our animal models was the fact that in the humans, 
they also decrease their anxiety, the CBD. We've now replicated that in our animal models. So that was the pathway into studying CBD. And at that time, no one was studying CBD, really. There were just a few groups, um, and especially in relation to psychosis, that started to study. And definitely no one on the street knew what CBD was. So it was challenging to get the studies going and to, you know, uh, convince people that there was something here. And many people, you know, bashed us that, you know, we're trying to, um, well, trying to promote cannabis use. So in one sense, I had one group who disliked us because we had shown that developmental THC was bad for the developing brain. And then this other group was saying, oh, you're trying to push cannabis with CBD for showing that it could be a treatment. So, you know, both groups hated us, but we went with like the, the data. So Yeah. I think the common, the common mistake both of those types of people make is to think of cannabis as a singular thing. But the whole point is it's actually a cocktail of different drugs and you have exactly. to understand each one. Can you talk a little bit more about the human studies with CBD? Were these people in the study already addicted to opioids and how much CBD were you giving them? Yeah. Um, so the... The study participants had to have, in this first study, had to have a heroin use disorder. So they were already heroin addicted. Like but they currently, have, currently using the drug? No. So they had to be abstinent at least um, at least one to two weeks. I mean, most people were in like a few, I mean, like one to three months of mm -hmm. abstinence when we studied them. And we didn't want to study them during um you know, withdrawal, acute withdrawal, because that's a completely different thing as well. And, and it becomes very complex. CBD might help with the withdrawal. I don't know, but I wanted to look at what we saw in our animal models, which was mainly craving, uh, you know, drug seeking. And so we wanted to look at that and not, like I said, this acute withdrawal, which can be challenging um, during, um, for people just coming off opioids. Um, we, as I said, at that time, no one knew anything about CBD. So to be honest, um, I just gave the people the dose that we had given to the rats that we mm. just asked. So the dose turned out to be um, 400 and 800 milligrams of CBD. And it was given um, about an hour before they were shown the cue. Mm -hmm. They were brought back the next day, given and tested again. And they, so they were given three doses. So it was a very short study because that's what we saw in our, our animals. It's like a, it's a short exposure to CBD actually had an impact. Mm -hmm. But it was, as I said, a high dose of 400 and 800 compared to what people buy in the stores, which is yeah. like 20, 20 milligrams or something. And are these pills? Were they swallowing pills? So um, we did, um, again, there were very, there was actually, I don't, I don't, there was, only GW at, at that time had human um, CBD for human clinical trials. I tried to get other companies, um, but and even NIH, but it was going to be too expensive to make the CBD at that time. Now there are a lot of companies, a lot of you know. Unfortunately, we can talk about that as well. Um, and so GW made me capsules to start. By this time, our second pilot. Um, they had now had epidiolex. So we actually used epidiolex, the oral solution for the, the second trial. Mm -hmm. So is it an oral solution like that you put under your tongue or? No, you drink, you, you drink it. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's largely an oral route of yeah. administration. Yeah, exactly. And we're now working, you know, so the, for me, you had asked the question and I realized I hadn't really responded bio bioavailability. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's one of the things with cannabinoids. Um, cannabinoids do not get absorbed very well. And so, for example, only about four to 6%, if we take it and, and you know, um, these oral solutions, not under the tongue, um, you only get a, a small percentage that gets into the body. Mm -hmm. And so for me, for medication development, we want to absolutely improve bioavailability, which will also improve, decrease variability between people. Because depending on what you eat or something, you can decrease, you know, you, you can have more or less CBD that goes in um, because we don't want to people to inhale. So obviously inhalation is, you know, going to give you a greater amount of the drug in your body, but inhaling anything is not medicinal. Mm 
So we did not want to develop any type of inhalation strategy. So we're looking at different types of formulations and, and working on that now. Mm-hmm. So when you say inhaling is not medicinal, can you distinguish for us between uh, three classes of inhalation from, from like a clinician's perspective? You could talk about smoking something, you could talk about vaporizing something, and you could talk about an inhalant like that you might take if you're an asthma patient. How do you think about those three different types of inhalation? And, and, and you know, for asthma patients, Absolutely. Those are great. The problem. And so one, one product that we're looking at has that kind of uh, strategy. And so that's fine. So you're right. I want to make sure it's about smoking. We don't want, you know, smoking is not the best route. Um, Vaping is also not a bad route, but because of all the things that have gone on with vaping and with the Um, you know, these um, black market types of uh, vaping devices that led to a lot of the the lung problems, we also don't want vaping. So um, inhalants are absolutely fine. um, And but we're trying to go with perhaps the conventional type of things that people consider medicine, and whether under the tongue or types of uh, capsules that are very that will be very fast in mm-hmm. terms of you know um, their bioavailability. We're we're prioritizing those types of strategies. Mm-hmm. What um, so when you swallow versus put something on, under the tongue versus inhale it, just be, just for the sake of talking about it because there are so many people out there inhaling things different ways. How does bioavailability generally compare across those modes of consumption for cannabinoids? Well, inhaling is going to get you the the uh, very fast into your into the body. Um, you have a lot of blood vessels under your tongue, so that mm-hmm. also the absorption is pretty quick. So that would be a, a route after inhalation, and then oral would be the lowest for the bioavailability. And so, uh, do you have any? I assume you have some ongoing studies that are following up on what you've described so far. So, what's going on today in your lab for CBD? So um, there are a number of different um, paths that we're um, going down right now. So I'm going back. Okay. Well, first we're, you know, the goal is to try to make medicine. So definitely larger clinical trials to really see, does this replicate in a larger population? Because if it doesn't replicate in a larger population, then, you know, it's not going to be effective in the clinic, but if you can carry out large um, clinical trials and figure out even the subgroups of people who might be uh, might benefit from CBD, or even if it's women are better than men and so on, those are still very helpful. Since as we talked about before, there's still not enough medications for substance use disorders. So I don't expect one medicine to cure everything. And I don't believe also that there will be a cure, but to treat everything. Um, So if we can even help a certain subgroup, to me, that would be amazing. So it's being able to now do larger clinical trials so that we can even see one replicate and see if there are subgroups who are more that benefit more than others. The other thing I'm coming back to the fact that I'm a neuroscientist. So I want to know what's happening in the brain why is CBD um, being beneficial in decreasing craving and anxiety? And we're doing that in two ways. Um, We're going back to our animal models now where we can go and get more molecular insights. And that's, you know, I think really critical. And like I said, we were able to replicate what we saw in humans, even on the anxiety front. So really trying to pin down the neurobiology because we might actually come up with another um, non-cannabinoid medication by understanding how CBD is impacting on these specific uh, uh, neuromodulators and neural circuits. But I'm also, um, like I said, masochistic. And so we're also doing in vivo imaging in humans Mm. to see about the neurobiology in the actual human brain. Um, in people being given in people with an opioid use disorder. So very similar to what we did before. So we definitely are recruiting. So people, anyone, you know, that can contact us. Um, So people with an opioid use disorder um, who are abstinent 
um, short-term abstinence is fine, or, um, and looking at CBD and seeing how it's impacting the human brain. Because I think that that's also critical if we're going to develop medicine for humans that we understand more about the human neurobiology. Mm -hmm. So in the studies that you described from your lab where you gave people with opioid use disorder, CBD, you were giving them between four and 800 milligrams. We talked earlier about the fact that CBD is not intoxicating like THC, but it is psychoactive. I'm curious, could, even though it was double blinded, could the people getting the CBD dose feel it? Did they report any type of psychoactivity? No, <laughs> you okay. know, and, um, and we're using lower doses. We're going to use lower doses now to also see how low can you go to still get an be a, a effective outcome. Mm -hmm. um, the thing that's interesting is sometimes the anxiolytic, the reduction of anxiety makes some people think, oh, it could be intoxicating, not intoxicating, but feeling calm sometimes people are like, oh, I feel good. Mm -hmm. And they think feeling good may be in, in, an intoxicant, but it's not. And very few people, even that those doses told us that they were like, oh, you know, like floating on air or so. No one, no one said that. Um, and, you know, the side effects that people reported, even people who had gotten the placebo, you know, also reported, you know, so um, it's sometimes it's, it's psychological. And that's why it is really critical for us to do placebo double blinded control studies. Again, I, I actually have nothing against placebo. If we could replicate placebo, I'm all for it. You know, everybody gets a saline, or, you know, a sugar tablet is fun, but it's, you know, it's called. But again, in terms of being able to replicate and to develop medicine that you know is accurate. It's like, you know, when you go into your medicine chest and, and cabinet and you take, you know, aspirin, there's a specific dose and you know what that aspirin is going to do each time. That's what we're trying to develop. And so we need to make sure, you know, that the dose, the route of administration, the particular subgroup that we know all of these things um, for CBD. And so without doing a double-blinded placebo control, people might start to say, oh, I'm feeling great, but they really aren't. And then they, they, you know, then they do go and relapse. So we really want to make sure that it's not just people hoping it works, wanting it to work, even on the clinical front that, you know, everybody wants to help um, the patients that it really is working. It has to be effective. Mm -hmm. So in your studies, you've been using, or at least for that one study, you were using Epidiolex. So this is presumably 98, 99% very pure CBD. Yeah. Are you doing anything or do you have any interest in understanding the so-called entourage effect, the fact that multiple compounds from cannabis, for example, at particular ratios might be more effective for certain things? You know, yes and no. So I do believe that um, many of the terpenes in cannabis can help to boost some of the effects of CBD or even THC. And so I think that those are important to study. And if we then figure out the ratio, when you think about it, in order to get the right ratio, you have to do a lot of research to figuring that out. Mm -hmm. I'm already exhausted. So <laughs> I mean, I'm, ha I'm happy other people do that and I'm happy to, to work with people. However, I'm going to come keep banging home this message, medicine, aspirin. We could have gone and taken the, the bark of the tree, right? That's where it came from. But there are other chemicals in the bark of the tree. But it was, you know, taking the specific chemical that we knew then that had this, you know, um, analgesic, anti-inflammatory, all of these, these effects. We want the same thing for CBD at least to start. So you know that you, that this is exactly the, the amount of CBD, the other chemicals, yes, might potentiate or reduce it, but you know, at least, you know, this amount will, will be reproducible, give you this, the, the, this outcome. So I don't think that it's, it, that the other chemicals are necessary to have a, a positive outcome, but 
clearly once, you know, some of them will allow us to decrease perhaps the amount of CBD that's needed. Mm -hmm. And then you, you could increase, you know, some other uh, terpene or other chemicals um, from the plant, but it will take a lot of work to talk about the, so the, that ratio. So, and the entourage quote unquote entourage effects are also complicated by the fact that biology usually works in like an inverted U shape, meaning things work really, it's a positive outcome and it has like this optimal um, dosing and ratio condition. And then as you increase the dose, it starts to go down. Mm -hmm. And so you start to have a decrease. So this inverted U, it works great. Then it starts not being effective and doesn't work. That's also a critical thing when you talk about entourage. So people like to throw around that term, but it's much more complicated. So you can, even with CBD and THC, there are different amounts of THC and CBD. And depending on the, the, the measure that you're having, that you can see that CBD can be beneficial in, in um, potentiating certain positive aspects of THC and other times it can reduces it, reduce that. So it is not that simple, quote unquote, entourage. And to make it a medicine, um, I think that's challenging. But if you have a specific strain of cannabis that has a certain ratio of CBD and you know all the other chemicals and you can, you're, you can make that reproducibly, absolutely that could be medicine. Absolutely. How did you even get into this area? What made you interested in studying cannabinoids in the first place? Um, you know, the funny thing is... Um, I started, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we're looking at the adult brain in um, trying to understand the neurobiology and knowing that people, it's not just a drug that brought them there. There's other things. So the genetics and trying to understand and early life events. And like I said, cannabis was one of them. And the funny thing I would say, my friends always tease me when I went into addiction because my friends from college. Um, because they're like, Yasmin, you never did anything. You're in Jamaica and you don't even smoke marijuana, you know? <laughs> so they were like, you're going to study this. You have to take it if you're going to study it. Um, so it wasn't an, uh, an interest in cannabis, the drug, as I have an interest in it now, because I think it's a really, it's a complex, really fascinating plant. Um, and being from Jamaica, uh, you know, originally, I never thought about cannabis in that way. And then in terms of looking at the developmental effects of cannabis, but it was THC and then studying CPD and now the terpenes and studying all of these things, it's been fascinating. So it's just, it's, it's you know, you ask a question, I thought it was a simple question that I asked. And then 10 years later, you know, it's become, it's, it has grown to this. So you never know where the path is gonna lead you. So did you go to college in the U S or in Jamaica? Yes, yeah. Oh no. I moved to the U S when I was a teenager. Young. Okay. Yeah. When did, when did you first get interested in science? I always tell people I was a weird kid. Uh, even in Jamaica, um, I was always interested in the brain as a kid. I have no idea why I've always loved science. I was just weird. I, I, my family, no one is a scientist or a doctor or a nurse. Or, well, actually, that's not true. I have a couple of nurses in my family. So my aunts will, will kill me if I say that. But, you know, um, my parents weren't. Um, I've always been fascinated about why people are the way they are in terms of just their behavior. I've been fascinated by behavior and just the planet. I mean, it's when I was a kid, I just, you know, it's just fascinating of why we're here. It's, it's still something that I think about all the time. Okay. So you've basically been interested in this. You were sort of always on this path. You were always interested in science and the brain and, and you just, you just stayed on that path throughout your entire life. Yeah. Yeah. I, as I said, I'm weird. I know it. I know it. I, you know, and um, I'm looking forward to just um, laying on a beach and not thinking about what those neurons, what the, talking to each other and so on, you know, and, but I can't stop thinking about how the brain works and whether, you know, the results that we have from this one thing can help to an idea for a treatment. It's, it's strange. I can't stop it. 
I have OCD. So my OCD is, is this. So yeah. Um, any other research going on right now that you think is particularly exciting in terms of addiction biology and CBD? Not necessarily in your lab. No, no, no. I mean, I, I think, you know, for, well, one thing that we're doing that I can't really tell, but it's really fascinating, but it doesn't have to do with addiction, but CBD. Um, but we'll see if it works and then I can come back. <laughs> um, CBD is now, you know, touted for so many things that it's worrying, but, you know, there are developmental disorders that are being studied that it will be fascinating if there are specific developmental disorders that CBD could help with other than those rare forms of childhood epilepsy that Epidiolex was, you know, got the FDA approval for, because that's one of the things that is so challenging in terms of trying to help kids and with mental illness and in our society where we don't have enough um, treatments, um, I, I think that that's, a, you know, I'm fascinated and, and, and optimistic and hope that those studies will work out. Um, but the fact that now, you know, CBD is thrown with so many things, my brain sometimes just like say, oh, okay, yet another thing, oh, you know, for writer's cramp, you know, like everything. So there are so many things that CBD is being um tested for, but for me, I'm particularly interested in developmental disorders um, that I hope that they will show some positive um, signals. So earlier you mentioned towards the beginning, you mentioned that there has been some research with respect to CBD's antipsychotic effects for things like schizophrenia. This is an area that people I think are often unaware of that doesn't get quite as much attention as some other areas. What do we actually know there? So what are traditional antipsychotic drugs and what, how do we define psychosis as, as a neuroscientist? So, I mean, I, it, it's funny that, that CBD has not gotten more attention in that, that realm because actually some of the earliest studies with CBD related to psychosis and psychosis in terms of, you know, classic thing that people think about, you know, the uh, people hallucinating, um, you know, loss of true cognitive control, um, you know, paranoid, um, paranoia. Um, so CBD, well, most antipsychotics, um, they are, they, they modulate our Again, coming back to even if I talk about like dopamine um, and um, some aspects of serotonin as well, but they they block the the, the classic antipsychotics block these dopamine receptors, and a lot of them have um, negative side effects, and you know even motoric side effects and so on. And so many people who have uh, schizophrenia, who are diagnosed with schizophrenia, they even stop taking their medications due to the, the bad side effects. They've done studies with CBD where they've um, shown that they could use um, with study CBD in psychosis in people with schizophrenia with their antipsychotic medication so that it could be an adjunct. So therefore you could even decrease the amount um, hopefully of these um, classic antipsychotic medications, but even CBD by itself was reducing psychosis. And in, and in particular, there are some fascinating studies from England in terms of prodromal um, effects of, of CBD. And what I mean by that is, we know there are certain um, risk factors for schizophrenia. And these teenagers that show these signs um, invariably go on to develop it. You, the goal for medicine is to try to, before someone you know, develops the disorder to and their prodromal, that they're in the early stages, they've not yet gotten the full blown disorder, but they're at a point where they may be treatable. Mm -hmm. And they've now been looking at CBD in, in such individuals. And from my understanding, the preliminary studies looked really promising that if CBD could be effective in prodromal um, psychosis, this is a game changer. So I think that that would be extremely critical for um, mental illness 
in, in, in general, because there are a lot of other disorders that I think that then it could lend itself for, but schizophrenia um, has been something that CBD had been studied early on and it, it hasn't gotten, I don't know why it hasn't gotten the, the, the attention um, as other disorders, but you know, we'll see in, uh, whether or not the prodromal effects, the effects of CBD to on, on individuals that are prodromal to potentially get the disorder will be effective. Because mm-hmm. again, One- CBD doesn't have all those negative side effects. Mm-hmm. And, you know, with, with, with teens and children, you want to try to have medications that are not going to have such a uh, a heavy hit on the brain. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I would imagine, you know, especially for something like schizophrenia where the, you know, the onset or the critical period is not necessarily in your teens, but maybe in your young adult years with the anti, the traditional antipsychotics, if they're dopamine receptor antagonists, the side effects there are probably pretty gnarly, like lack of motivation, lack of pleasure. Is it that type of stuff? Yeah. So you, so it, it blunts a lot of your, you know, um, feelings, you know, positive yeah. feelings and so on. So those are some of the, the negative side effects of those um, particular medications. And, you know, it's, it, it's challenging. It's, you know, I don't think that people understand that a lot of the, the medications that are, um, that really do help people. I mean, I want to say that they, they do help people, but they do come with a lot of side effects. And so um, individuals stop taking them because of those side effects and so that's why it's also critical for us to try to develop medications. We try to, but, you know, without, you know, such severe side effects, the goal is not to try to develop medications with side effects, but coming back to, you know, the earlier discussion, why I'm actually fascinated by CBD is that, you know, we were taught in school in pharmacology that you find the purest, the strongest mm-hmm. agonist or the purest, strongest antagonist, mm-hmm. but those are the ones that are producing all of these side effects. So for me, something that is, has a softer impact of tweaking the different, you know, on a more modulatory manner rather than like a hammer, I think that that's the thing that, you know, um, has opened my eyes, at least in thinking differently about perhaps how we should develop medications. And it doesn't mean it has to be for all medications. This has to be the strategy, but for mental illness, especially where the side effects do, um, cause a lot of individuals to stop taking their meds. I think that this is something, you know, we should consider. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's a change that's happening more generally in this world, at least on the research side where people are looking, looking a little bit more closely on drugs that you would otherwise traditionally have called dirty? Yes or no, it depends. I mean, there's still two two schools, two camps of this, and it depends on who you get to review your grants. Some of them say, no, you know, this is or not. But I think one of the things that science that we're also doing is repurposing medications. So there have been a lot of medications that have been tried and hasn't worked, as we talked about earlier, but there are now databases of those. And as we learn about the biology of certain disorders, People are now screening these databases of these medications that didn't work for, say, cancer, but actually might work even in addiction. And because now we see that the mechanism by which they worked, um, we see similar things that are occurring for a particular addiction or psychosis or something. And that, to me, is also important because many of these drugs have been tested and we know the side effects we know that the you know all of these things so repurposing some of these medications are also something that the field is doing besides saying stepping back from calling things dirty and mm-hmm. i hate the word dirty you know um because end of the day a lot of our transmitter our own uh, modulators in our bodies are quote unquote dirty and it is the symphony that makes for our behavior, our thoughts. It's not one transmitter that does is working at one time. It's all of these transmitters and neuromodulators and different cells firing and different circuits activated, why I move my hand, why I'm thinking certain things. So that's why for me, having a more modulatory uh, type of of, uh, a multi-scaled approach rather than this one transmitter approach, I think is important. Mm 
Interesting. Well, do you have any final, final thoughts for people about CBD and cannabinoids or addiction biology generally? I mean, for me, I do think that in terms of, you know, we've talked obviously about CBD a lot and, but about THC, you know, I've mentioned briefly the issue of very high concentrations of, of THC today in cannabis being consumed recreationally. And that is a problem for mental illness. That is a problem for addiction. We know that it's THC that leads to the addiction and the higher the concentration of THC, the, the more vulnerable people are to developing a cannabis use disorder. So many people think that you can't develop an addiction to cannabis and you do. In fact, um, cannabis use disorder is one of the highest um, disorders in our country. So, you know, uh, and about like 30% of people develop a cannabis use disorder who, you know, play with cannabis. So it's not a benign drug and we need to, really clamp down on that as well and, and educate people about the health risks of this high THC cannabis that's being consumed. So for all that's being said about CBD, which is great, it's important that we don't forget that. And um, I mean, coming back to, you know, even psychosis in our dual diagnosis ward at, at Sinai, a large percentage of people in the dual diagnosis, meaning have addiction and, and a mental health disorder, it's cannabis with psychosis. It's cannabis with psychosis. So no one can tell me that cannabis does not have negative effects. So even though I'm trying to also look at the beneficial properties of cannabis, it's it's a drug and we need to be respectful of it. And, and as I said, especially in certain vulnerable groups. And that's why I, you know, I, I, I want people to um, also explore and educate themselves about cannabis. Even though we have a natural endocannabinoid system, it's not as powerful and potent as the, as the concentrations of THC out on the street today. All right, Yasmin Hurd, thank you for your time. Thank you so much. <laughs>